probably don't feel proud of yourself. You probably have some messed up cycles of negative thoughts. You might be addicted to substances. You have low levels of confidence. You struggle to take action. So we do things that we feel like doing. And most of the time we feel like sitting there just scrolling on your phone looking at Instagram models. Gain XP in your taking action skill by doing the hard work even when you don't feel like it. I've been like that myself. I've been the drinker, I've been the partier. And so I see the hidden sadness behind the masks that everyone's wearing where they're all happy right now, but they're gonna be hungover tomorrow. They're also gonna be too tired to do anything productive on Sunday, and then they're gonna go back to work on Monday and hate their lives. If you want to become a masculine, strong, successful man, you need discipline. You need to go and do the work that is required of you, even when you don't feel like doing it. I am Every single day, even though it was difficult, even though it, it took my soul away from me. I had to kill myself. That version of me needed to die to create this new version. What's up guys, welcome to the channel New Geld, which means new money. It's my channel together with my best friend, Joop, and we are also business partners. Today is our first English pod with Hamza, and I'm very delighted he's here in the beautiful city of Amsterdam. And we're going to do an amazing pod. I'm sure you all like it. Let me know if you want us to do more English podcasts, and if so, who should be your next guest down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe and like, and let me know your thoughts after the podcast. With that being said, enjoy the show. It's going to be a very, very nice conversation about a lot of stuff. Let's get straight into it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the New Money Podcast. Today, we're in here in Amsterdam, and I'm joined by no one less than Hamza Ahmad, all the way from the UK. Or you're living in Dubai now, I think? No, in the UK. Okay, welcome to my country. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here, brother. Thank you for having me. It's great. What brings you here to Amsterdam today? I have a, an event for my Adonis School students. So we're doing a meetup business mastermind today. I've rented out like a room somewhere nearby. So I'm giving like a big business talk there. And then we have a big outdoor workout tomorrow morning as well. An outdoor workout here yeah. in Holland. Yeah. In, um, uh, what's it called? Me, next to Vondel Park, there's, a, there's another park there, Big Field. I'm yeah. just going to go like wrestle in the mud, basically. <laughs> <laughs> wrestle in the mud over there. <laughs> <laughs> because you have like a kind of fight club like um, yeah. community, right? You yeah. organize like fight club meetups. Yeah. Everywhere I travel to, we'll bring out like some gloves or. Um, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll go do something like crazy primal, like mm -hmm. outside in a park or something. So it's, it's very yeah. nice when like 60, 50 guys come out and they always say to us, <laughs> like, there's always like one guy who says like, oh, I barely ever leave my home. And this was like the best thing I've done so far. You know, we, we hike up mountains together and stuff. So it's, it's really awesome. Sounds amazing, yeah. Do you Thank ever you. have trouble with the police or something, like interfering? No, surprisingly not, you know. No? In, in Dubai, a bunch of the kids were telling me like, be careful. Yeah. We, we were sparring outside and obviously Dubai is quite strict for that. But no, nothing, nothing's ever happened before. Not yet. Sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. We'll see what happens on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is Amsterdam, man. It's the woke leftist uh, capital of the world, basically. <laughs> so I want to ask you, like uh, being on topic of Amsterdam, like what do you think of red light district, um, like being allowed to smoke weed and stuff? What's your opinion on that? I've never been to red light district. I've never even like saw it, to be honest. So I'd, huh? I've, I think I've seen like some videos of there's just prostitutes or something. Um, to be honest, I, I don't feel that that strongly about it. It's definitely degenerate. There, there's a weird value to having sex as a as a career as a business. Certainly, I think you know there's a huge problem with OnlyFans, with Instagram models, and all this. But sex was like the oldest profession, and f and for good reason. Mm -hmm. And so, I think I don't know. Netherlands is still maybe holding on to that. I haven't looked at the history, so I don't know if this is if it's like kind of a new thing or not. If this is back from like the old days, but I remember Tate talking about this once, which was like it used to be legal, like sex work used to be legal because it meant that men could be in a committed relationship and just go sleep with a girl from like the, the brothel or something. Mm -hmm. 
and it wasn't really deemed as cheating. But when you take that away from a man and then you give him porn, it's like it's not satisfying. He's a loser. He, d- I guess it's the same thing anyway. But and with weed as well. You ever done f- drugs or anything? Huh? Have you ever done drugs or anything? Yeah, a lot, bro. <laughs> too much. <laughs> but with, with weed, it's really, like, yeah, really have. Yeah, but oh, really, I thought you were sarcastic. No, no, I was um, 19, 20 years old, degenerates in university, overdosing, smoking every day, taking MD, taking everything. Really? Every, I was doing like dirty drugs. I wouldn't have expected like, that from you. Yeah, no, you wouldn't have. Cause I've, I've changed a lot in the last few years. Yeah. But when I was like 20, 21, when I moved to university and I was just surrounded by like similar people, we were staying up to like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., just taking anything we could. No one really, really likes themselves in that kind of situation Crazy. so you're just chasing whatever high possible you're 25 26 now 26, right yeah. so that all changed over the last five years like from the entire end of the spectrum to the entire yeah. other end of the spectrum basically how did that change happen entrepreneurship that's the biggest thing when i got to 21 years old i graduated from university with a psychology degree and i was only eligible for the same jobs as before university 17.5k a year 17k a year 64 after uni yeah if i got like a maybe a a higher class honors or something maybe it would have been a little bit higher but i used to go to work all day take the wake up at five take the tram to work um, take like these complaint calls and everything then come back home at 6 p.m an entire day for 64 pounds like 75 dollars and i used to hate my life i used to cry so often like i used to take the the public transport the tram and there was like this shortcut which was like completely dark so you needed you know like your phone flashlight to see and oftentimes i'd turn my flashlight off and i'd just like start crying on the way like walking backwards to my apartment looking trying to find like my apartment thing see if my girl's getting fucked by anyone else like my mind was so so fucked i was so so unhappy so like this is life the girl next to me in work she was like oh but don't worry hamza you know this year for christmas we get two days off and, and it, I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> like, well, like, like I was still out in school mindset, you know, in school yeah. you get two weeks off or something. I was like, oh damn, like we're actually working full time now. This is what <laughs> life is for these people. That's crazy. And they were nice people, but I didn't fit in. I was, I was six foot one, 10% body fat, six pack, shaven head, training for the military. I was, I was eating my, <laughs> my sandwich secretly in, the, in my shift so that I had more time in my lunch break to go to the gym again after already going in the morning. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Second time today. <laughs> Timo, keep the towels here, some, bro. No, no, those are wet, those are wet. In the, in the bathroom, there are like loads of towels. <laughs> and get, get some more for uh, get this away just to be us, sure. <laughs> That's the second time that's second happened Second time today. today. <laughs> well, I can just continue anyway. It's still yeah, filming. Let's do it. <laughs> so, Where were we? Um, uh, you were <sighs> going to the gym for the second time on your uh, lunch break. Yeah. So I, I didn't fit in with like the normal nine to five. And that's when I started to get thoughts of entrepreneurship. Okay. Making money online. Everyone's talking about it. There was this one guy on YouTube called Iman Gaji. And I kept on seeing his adverts and I was like, what a dick. Honestly, yeah, I, I was had like, the same he's, feeling, he's bro. such a scammer. <laughs> he's younger than me. He's a mil- no, a yeah. scammer, liar, whatever. But it stayed in my mind. It stayed in my mind. And that's when I started to look into drop shipping, e-commerce, writing e-books, YouTube, um, creating content, becoming a rapper, um, flipping everything. I, w- I was looking into so many different businesses. And it was, it was, for months, I'd love to tell you it was a quick thing, you know, okay, I, I suddenly changed my life, but it was about six months straight where I wanted to be a businessman and I was making almost no progress because my productivity was so bad. I had such an inability to sit down and focus and actually get good work done. Thank yeah, you. Thank bro. you. Sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> what was the first business you started with when you saw that advert? Uh, flipping on eBay. Flipping on eBay, like yeah. the Gary V couch flipping thing. Kind of. I, I did it with like gym clothes, like with um, Adidas jumpers. Mm-hmm. Basically, like someone had spoke about it online, like on Reddit. And so oh, thank you. And so on the same day, I went onto eBay and posted a picture of like a gym shark, gym hoodie that I had. Mm-hmm. And I put it up for sale for like 25 pounds. Went to sleep, woke up and it sold. And that was like my first ever like online income. Good feeling. No. Technically, I sold it at a loss. <laughs> like, I <don't laughs> yeah. so, but I mean, still, like, I, I got money online. You got right? revenue. You got revenue. 
So I started to do that really well. And I started to like buy other things from eBay, from thrift stores. I'd go traveling and, and find some stuff randomly. And I'd list that for profit on eBay and make like 10 pounds profit per, per sale. But it wasn't completely online. You needed like this inventory. You need, I was maybe doing like 1,000 a month, but you needed like this physical product. I had a girl who at the time was like very, very much in love with me. So she made it easy. I only needed to, to do the digital things. She did everything else. She, she packaged it all up, wrote the address, went to the post office, paid for the postage and everything. And all I had to do was just the eBay stuff. But I knew I couldn't scale this. I knew that this would got to be, be careful. You yeah. won't be charged with human trafficking then. Yeah. If you got girls helping you make money. And that's a really good <laughs> you gotta be, you got to be careful these days, man. You never know. <laughs> Put that finger back. <laughs> but yeah, no, so um, I, I just wanted to do something completely online. And I was looking at drop shipping, all these different businesses, but I just wasn't able to make progress because I was smoking weed, I was eating junk food, I was staying up late, I was watching porn, I was doing all like the one side, like you said. Yeah. And but my desire for for business was just so high that I was willing to basically kill that version of myself, destroy everything that I had, the relationship, the apartment, the lifestyle, the identity, take a hit to my ego, move back home to my parents' home, where there was so much trauma and resentment and fights and arguments. But knowing that if I moved back home, I'd be able to focus. I wouldn't have the girlfriend. I wouldn't be able to like smoke weed at home. <clears throat> I wouldn't need a job. I wouldn't need income, which meant that I could go all in on one business. And so I decided that it would be YouTube. And then since that moment, I've been like kind of clean where I, I don't want substances to kind of change my mind. I'm not like a saint. I'm not a Puritan. I, I, I certainly will still like drink every now and then fine, but it, I'm not a degenerate anymore. I'm, I, I, I can't remember those days where I'd wake up and I'd just start smoking weed every single day. Did you really do that? Every day like for, for about a year straight. Really? Every single day. It was it was absolutely... How crazy. expensive is that? If you were on like 17k a year, yeah. you smoke weed every single day. That's can't like half your income. Yeah, exactly. That, really? that was the problem. Because when you don't like your life, this is the problem with like nine to five careers. Okay, super quick guys. We don't do any advertisements or promotions whatsoever on this podcast. I'm just going to talk to you about my own business. I have an AI business called AI Assist and we make your customer service better, faster and cheaper. Basically, we can reduce your refund rate from 8% to 2% like we did for two of our last clients in the past two months. As soon as you start working with us, you'll notice your customers are happier, give you better ratings, better reviews, they'll order more, and your customer service won't be much of a headache anymore. Instead, you have a really relaxing life, and AI can handle all of the bullshit questions from customers for you. We're already live for over 30 stores worldwide, answering over 60,000 customer questions each month. It's a state-of-the-art AI that's trained to make angry customers actually happy customers by using psychological papers. Maybe Hamza could have written one of them. I don't know. He's a psychology major. So with that being said, oh, by the way, you can check us out down below on the first link in the description and schedule a call with us to see if we can help your business. And that being said, let's get back into the pod. Mm -hmm. It puts you in a state where you lack so much freedom and, and time that often you're not going to like your life. Mm -hmm. You make the money and you can save it. But truthfully, most people don't save money when they don't like their lives. They spend money on bullshit, instant gratification, like weed, junk food, deliveries, whatever, to just try and make themselves a little bit happier. So even though I was working so hard and I was doing the good nine to five, like you know everyone respected, I wasn't even ending up saving any money because I didn't like my life and I just kept on ordering more weed and food deliveries. And that was actually the last, th like the last straw, actually on the last day that I was there. I said to myself, you know what? If I order weed again today, even though I'm broke, even though I want to like be an entrepreneur, even though I don't want to smoke, I'm going to leave. After six months of thinking about the decision, I, I just thought it. And I'd straight away, I, I actually knew, truthfully, I was like, I'm too weak to even like say no. Like, I'm, I'm going to go get more weed. I'm going to smoke tonight. And so I'll just, I'll just like, I can't do it here. I, I can't live. Crazy story, bro. You've come a long way then. Thank you. That's, yeah, it's really good to hear. Thank you. And then that YouTube. You started with YouTube, first of all. Did you have any kind of... Um, plan or like vision that you were, would grow to 2 million subscribers in how long have you been doing this? Two, three years? Four years? Maybe about three and a half years. Three and a half years, yeah. yeah. Uh, not at first. So at first YouTube was just online income. That's all I wanted. I wanted to make 2,000 a month so that I didn't need a full-time job. And then maybe around this was May 2020 and maybe just after a couple of months that's when the comments started to come in that my videos were changing lives. That guys weren't suicidal anymore because of the messages I was putting out and at, at that point it, it, it wasn't it wasn't as simple as just being a business anymore it became kind of like a masculine duty that I have like this this gift of I don't know speaking giving advice explaining things that just seems to click for a lot of young guys 
And so that's when I started to take it a lot more seriously. And then in December of the same year, so about seven months, we hit 1,000 mm -hmm. subscribers. And it was quite slow, slow but consistent growth up until May of, or June of 2021. And that's when the one video blew up. And um, we started gaining like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 subscribers every single day. It's great to hear, man. And that all happened because you saw Iman Gadzi yeah. flexing on his advertisement. You know, I actually <laughs> and really now you know him. So that's a yeah, good, exactly. Yeah. This is his, like, he gifted me this Rolex, right? It's of course cool he did. <laughs> Let me show you inside of it. You, you might not be able to get it on the camera, but you can read the engraving. One million Adonis's. Yeah. <laughs> you spelled it wrong, <laughs> That's a beautiful one. It's nice, isn't it? It's really nice, yeah. So, Because th this was an important belief breaker for me. So I saw Iman Gaji's adverts when I was trying to be an entrepreneur. And I, it's like so interesting. I couldn't help but think he had to be lying because it was like my own insecurity. How can this guy who's younger than me be more successful and make so much money? It's got to be a lie. It's got to be a scam. It's got to be cheating, whatever. And then when I actually finally met him in, in 2022, of course it's all fucking real. Of course it is. It's like, I think influencers get like a really bad rap, especially like money influencers. And maybe there are certainly some which are like shady, whatever. But honestly, many of them are like as rich as they say, truly. And when I, I spend time with him at his place and, and he's made amazing, massive moves since then, it makes me look back to that version of myself where I was so insecure and jealous, where I, like, I couldn't see another man's success. And actually just think like, damn, like good for you. You worked hard. Is this videos of him when he's like 13 years old, he's grinding. It's like respect. Yeah, why why can't we just say that? I, every now and then I'll see, I'll see some kid who, who says this with me as well. He's like, oh, Hamza's lying about this. And I always just think like, man, I, I used to feel the same way. And it, and it hurts me to see that because I wish us as young men, I wish we were able to just look at another man's success and just be like, man, nice work. Like like you just did, it's like, nice work. You made so much progress. I wish we could acknowledge that more. Yeah, just but be we, more positive in general. But we can't. We go, oh, he's lying. Oh, he's yeah, on steroids. Oh, he's this. <laughs> it's always, I think it's especially like, in Holland, it's even more. I don't know about the UK and stuff, but in Holland, it's like we have a saying like you got to do normal, and that's more than enough. Mm. So whenever you get like um, outside of the crowd, you immediately get them chopped down. Yeah. That's really like mediocre mentality in Holland for some reason. Yeah. Is that also in the UK? Yeah, th in s in some ways. I was speaking to someone in my gym about this. I was saying it's kind of like tall puppy syndrome. Like when when one flower yeah, exactly, grows yeah. above the others. If it's gonna get cut down because you got to keep yeah. it all in line. I didn't know how to put that saying into English. That's it's a Chris a Williamson. It's a poppy syndrome. Tall poppy syndrome. Tall yeah. poppy I love that from Chris Williamson. Okay. He's he's good with words, isn't he? <laughs> so, and yeah, and and um, it, the UK is similar. I think you guys have the same culture here, where if you become super successful, you don't really stay here, which is a shame, isn't it? Because True. like I was saying yeah. it to you guys, it's like it's such a, a beautiful place. I've been to Netherlands. This is my third time now. UK as well. It's like I've traveled all around. I moved to Dubai. I moved to, to Thailand, Bali, and I keep coming back to the UK because it's so it's so clean and, and and natural and it's so amazing, like the countryside. But when a country treats its rich people and successful people poorly, you see this dynamic where basically no one who actually makes it stays there. Like this was just normal for me when I was in school. That any like rich old family, as soon as they retired, they'd go to Spain. These days, any rich young guy, as soon as he makes a good money, where does he go? He goes to, to Dubai, Dubai, Bali. Exactly. Yeah. Because th those places treat rich people very nicely. And it, it's problematic because this is my opinion, and, and I'm not like too well versed into politics, but I think a country that treats its most successful people poorly with high tax rates and, and villainizing, villainizing, it's bound to fall because what kind of people will stay? It's not going to be True. the high performers. True. So all the high performers of the world are going to Dubai, they're going to Bali, Thailand, they're, they're all like enjoying themselves there. And almost none of them are actually staying in UK and Netherlands, which makes it hard to connect as well, doesn't it? Yeah, true. It's really a shame, especially like given the history, like Amsterdam used to be the most beautiful, biggest, richest city in the world. You know, the building on the dam was once the biggest building in the world. Wow. Like what the Burj Khalifa is right now. Yeah. It literally was. And the stock market was invented like 200 yeah. meters away from here. So it's really a shame to see that fall. Yeah. Have you, sorry to interrupt, have you ever read um, Principles for a Changing World Order by Ray Dalio? No, I haven't. It's, so, so Ray Dalio is a billionaire. He's a billionaire investor. And he actually, he has a video that people could go watch, Principles of a Changing World Order. He basically talks about the cycle, mm -hmm. kind of like hard times create strong men, like that cycle where a nation will, will do so well through grit and hard work and, and, strong values and when it gets to a certain level of prosperity the 
good times, that's when the nation starts getting weaker. That's when they start, you know, the politics changes and they're not in a time of war or, or uh, of chaos anymore. So they start getting a bit softer. They, they in general, lean a bit more to the left. And that's when, like, the decline starts happening. There's a financial bubble and everything. And then near at, right at the, the last part of this cycle, there's a new new world order, which is what happened with... with um, with Britain, yeah, it's and, probably and like Russia, India, exactly, uh, and, and Brazil and now. It's happening China. right now. People don't want to talk about yeah. this. Like you just mentioned, BRICS, like the the new formation. It's happening as we speak right now. Like the US is is the world order. It's like the most important country in the world. It won't stay that way. Honestly, 10, 20 years time. Like if you look at the direction it's going into, it'd be very unlikely that there's a sudden massive rise. Because again, that the smartest, mm. most successful people are leaving that country. The same with UK. So. I, I can't imagine which which country is going to dominate. It has to be China. Yeah. Like, if you see China, it's so insane to see. Like, Shenzhen, for example, a city near Hong Kong, I think. Have you seen pictures of that in the 90s? No. It was literally like a fishing village of 10,000 people, and now there's 20 million people living there. Wow. Skyscrapers everywhere, huge financial center, yeah. biggest manufacturing hub in the world. Yeah. It's just crazy to see that happened in 20 years. Wow. That used to take, like, 300 years for a city to v- develop like that. Yeah. And your, your daily experience, like I was saying it to you guys when I got here, like I, I landed at the airport mm-hmm. and I was just getting an Uber to my to my hotel. I'm seeing the d- deterioration of Amsterdam. I'm seeing it. It's like even even in like the mainland where it's supposed to be really wealthy. I'm driving past, there's, there's rubbish all over the floor. There's graffiti all over the walls. It's so sad to see because like you said, it's such, yeah. it is a beautiful place with amazing people. But every, like I've, I've come here like three years, three times. And it's like every year, it, it, it just seems worse. And I, I want to talk about the race issue as well. I think it's important. <laughs> like, I, I'm brown, so I can say this. But like, this is what I genuinely spotted on the way here on the Uber. There's like a group of like brown Middle Eastern guys they just stood there smoking. And it, it seemed to me like a, like a Dutch local girl walking past. And the guy's just like staring at her. And I was like just looking at it in the in the Uber. And I was just thinking like, what kind of like politician lets that happen? It's such a weird dynamic where you've let in other people who. And it was like, bro, it was it was what two p.m. on a Wednesday. It was work time as well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I'm no, an entrepreneur, so I'm always it's on the terrible. clock. But like that's weird, right? And then, and I, I promise, literally five minutes later, another group of brown like Middle Eastern guys sat outside like on the, on the bench all drinking loads of cans around them and stuff and I, again i could see like what looked like the local guys kind of like looking over and like you know you just it feels a bit like unclean dirty oh. dangerous and it, it, it's not even like a race issue it's just when you bring in people who aren't the the strongest best people when you bring in like like people who aren't capable in business or high level careers but what are they going to be doing at 2 p.m.? On yeah, Wednesday? it's just pure like immigration theory, like in economics, right? If you have all the benefits for the um, poorer people, basically, you're going to attract more poorer people. Yeah. If you tax all the rich people, because you have plenty of rich, like um, amazing scientists from uh, Middle Eastern countries stuff and right stuff. So if you bring in them and you give them the benefits, they will come. But now we don't give them any benefits. No, we tax them like the highest level in the world. And then we give all the benefits to the, to the lower classes. And then you attract all the lower classes and your whole society de- uh, deteriorates. Yeah. So it's terrible to see. Yeah. Picture this, right? Yeah. You are, you're a tribe leader. You've got like okay. a fence around your tribe. Yeah. You've kept it safe. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's prosperous. Awesome. I knock on the tribe doors. Straight away you're thinking, we're not going to let this guy in. Of course not. But all the, the young liberal women, the ones with blue hairs, are saying, no, 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 let him in, let him in. <laughs> you literally look at me as a fighting age, high testosterone man. You notice that I'm erect at the same time <laughs> yeah. as well. And I'm staring at your women. And, and then you're like, no, 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 we, like, I know what's going to happen. Like, you know, all the elders are saying, yeah. you know, we, we know what's going to happen. But we don't let in other people from other tribes. But they put pressure onto you. They think you're evil. They think you're racist. Then what? There's too much pressure. You're... you're yeah, elected like, off. Someone else lets yeah. me in. What's going to happen? Truthfully, what's, it, it sounds crazy for me to say racist or whatever. But what am I going to do when I when I come here? I'll let you finish this point. Ex- well, we all know what's going <laughs> to happen. Yeah. I'm going to change your culture. Your culture is going to be changed by people who are, who are bringing in their culture from a different place. And that can be good. Diversity can be nice. But if you're bringing in people who aren't the best, which direction is your country going to go through? True. Doesn't even matter the race or skin color. It doesn't matter. No, it's uh, very apparent to me. Like when um, 
Egypt and Jordan both said like we're not taking any refugees from like nowhere. Not not from and no no single neighboring country they're taking refugees. Because they're like, we don't want those people. And you can't really say that Egypt and Jordan are racist because they're, it's exactly the same, right? Jordan or Egypt or uh, whatever. So that was amazing to me to see, okay, they're not taking them in. They're like literally neighboring countries. And we are taking everyone in there in Europe. I think it's so madness what's happening in Europe with the European Union. Yeah. And European Union is literally the biggest disgrace in the world. Yeah. I studied it a lot in school and university, but it's so terrible. Like the more you know about it, the more you just think we've got to get rid of it. You know, th- there was a news story I, I read a few years ago. It was on New Year's of uh, 2019. Mm-hmm. And it was, there was over a hundred, uh, uh, over a thousand like migrants in, I think, Germany. And they just started taking a party for New Year's, whatever, like in public. And they basically sexually assaulted over like a hundred girls, raped a few yeah, girls. It like was in Cologne, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At the the ban of the station. They cover that type of stuff up. Yeah. And it, they'll say like I'm I'm racist. It, it whoever would say it usually is put in a difficult difficult position when I say it. If you said it, okay, it's like oh easy, <laughs> cancel him, right? But I'm I'm saying it as a brown guy because it's like that must be fucking terrifying. Sure. Imagine just being like some some I don't know some local German woman who's going home and you know she had to work on on the night shift and then there's a fucking thousand like Middle Eastern guys like looking at you and, and touching you and like it like even just yesterday like I, I felt so it was so dirty to see that there were four or five like full grown men just staring at this girl walking past and it's like they they don't bring the same culture the same manners and I don't blame the 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 people who look at that and think like damn like my country's failing right now I don't yeah, blame exactly. you for that. But- to come back to your metaphor about like your tribe leader and someone's knocking on the fence and then you're basically being emotionally influenced to, okay, I'm not racist, blah, 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 let them in. But that's why I think like men like you and me should stand up and just don't give a shit. Like just no, say no. Hold firm. That's it. Yeah. Hold firm, yeah. yeah. But there's a lot of pressure because then they can throw a lot of words at you. They can say you're misogynist, you're racist, yeah, you're that. far right, or this is... <laughs> Believe me, they've thrown those at me already. <laughs> I don't give a damn. <laughs> I don't give a damn. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a quote at you, a la Chris Williamson, and Let's then you it. can explain them. All right? Okay. So this is about dating. My standards for dating are abnormally high. If a girl has any kind of social media, that's a direct no go. Yeah. Explain. Absolutely. Okay, I'll make a quick disclaimer. Let's say, okay, if a girl has a social media, she's got 200 followers, private account, family. Okay, absolutely fine. If she's got like a big social media, a thousand followers, she, you know, she randomly gets guys on it and stuff. It's like, I just find that's very Im- inappropriate in a relationship. It, it's kind of like a relationship is kind of like a castle. And you're the one, both of you actually, it's your jobs to keep this castle safe. You're the king, she's the queen. You need to have the kind of queen who you know that is helping you keep this castle more secure most queens in the modern day are stood on the castle walls showing their butt to the barbarians and bringing them inside and edging them basically they're they're like bringing them inside the walls Mm -hmm. and that's a disgrace like what what happened to like actually staying in a committed relationship if you're if you're bringing in risk to your relationship most women will literally tease the barbarian it's it's like if you think of that picture it's it's weird it's like that's that's inappropriate girls will literally like the amount of girls i could tell you who tell me they've got a boyfriend and they'll be like, oh, but you can have my Instagram. And then they're flirting on there and I've met girls from that as well. It's like, it's another way in. It, it's completely inappropriate. And, and this isn't even to say the kind of pictures that many women will post as well. If they're showing a lot of like their, their body, sexy pictures and stuff, it, they're advertising what should be private. It should be yours. The only disclaimer, the only um, exception I'll say is that, okay, if, if they're business minded, if you're business minded, like for example, my Instagram's business. So I'm posting things that is probably kind of inappropriate in a relationship. You can see my body and everything. But it's like, I make money from that. I make money from like how I look and my physique. The lifestyle what if your girl have. makes money from Instagram then? Is it then allowed? It, it, I would say it depends. It, it, you've got to take it case by case. If she makes money from Instagram because she funnels people to her OnlyFans, I like, yeah, probably not. If she makes money from her Instagram because she has like a, um, some food page and you know she's there in a nice dress or something and she's showing the cooking yeah i think that's fine so i think we have to i can't give you one clear answer but i will say in general i'm seeing many men struggling in relationships and women because 
both partners have Instagram and it's like a risk to their relationship. They're getting messages from random people, girls especially getting messages from guys like two, three times a day. Wasn't there that, that study last time? Like 64% of Americans are keeping a second option for their partner like yeah. behind their back. Yeah, That's crazy yeah. to think about it. Like you're in a relationship with someone and the second it breaks, you got the second option. They already know who it is. Yeah. And, and you know what the, the heartbreaking thing is? Both partners know who it is usually. So yeah. it's like, imagine being in a relationship with a girl and you've seen this one guy like pop up to her and you know, he likes her pictures and you've noticed that she's liked his pictures. Like if, if it's just so bad for your, your mental health. I've not had the, to Bro, deal with this. Like always. literally I've not had to deal. <laughs> let me tell you, okay. My first ever girlfriend, eight, 19 years old. I did everything for the first time with her, lost my virginity and everything. Amazing relationship, right? And I became so anxious because when you really, really, really love a woman, you'll find out, bro. So it's like, I'm on her Instagram and you know, she's posted like an, just a selfie, whatever, it's fine. But it's like, I can't help but to like click on the likes and okay, who are these guys? And I click on one True. and then I, I scroll and it's like, oh, I think this could, oh. And I see that he posted a picture. She liked it on the date that she told me that she had had like a boyfriend beforehand or a hookup beforehand. When the, the problem is if you're like quite a committed, loving guy, you'll find out all the details of your girl's past and it, it's brutal. Now I, I can come to you as you know as a strong man here, and I, it's been seven years since that point. It broke me. It honestly broke me for for months. I was so unhappy and anxious, and I was so bonded with this woman. She was my first everything. So bonded with her, but I could never look at her the same way because I had literally seen the pictures and the profiles of the men that had her before me. And no man, if you really love a woman, you can never look at a woman the same way if you know which guy has fucked her before you. It's just, it's completely like, just like primal. And it, yeah. it ruined an amazing relationship. She was such a sweet girl, but I could never look at her the same way. But, it, but I couldn't break up with her either because, you know, I wasn't strong enough, but also I was so in love with her. So it was months of total, total heartbreak, anxiety, depression, overthinking, stress in exam season in university. So that didn't help as well. And when I see young guys in the same situation and every now and then a student will message me saying like, oh bro, like I've seen her Instagram. She's liking this guy's pictures. I, I feel so sad because I, I haven't had that for so long. Oh, I had exactly like, the same thing, yeah. man. I, had, I used to have a girlfriend from Sweden. Yeah. So uh, we were here like in Holland and um, she was making like a stupid Snapchat or something. It was ugly pictures. So I grab her phone and delete the picture, right? So I see the Snapchat and I see like a few guys in the snaps, like in there. And my heart just dropped like fuck. <laughs> you know, I was like instantly, okay, we're done. Nice, we're done. Wow. Yeah. So next day she was on the plane back to Sweden and, uh, wow. and never spoke to her again. Respect. But respect yeah, for but that, it was like, literally that I know to do that is because of guys like you, because if we wouldn't have you or Tate or whatever, whoever speaks about it, like young guys don't know it. And I can see it all the time with like 18 year olds, 17 year olds, like younger, younger versions of me as well. I didn't know that that was the proper way to do it. Mm. But, Otherwise, it would have just like, oh, can you please not talk yeah, to them? And, uh, you know, like have that six month shit period. And then in the end, you break up anyway because she cheats or something. So you always lose, basically. Mm. There's no way of really winning this. That, you know, you made such a good point. It's it's guys like Tate and, and this kind of like new modern relationship advice that men are giving out, which is, you know, to be high value and to not take disrespect from women. And, and there's so much complaints about this. You know, this is basically what we're talking about. It's like toxic masculinity. The thing is, no man wants to be toxic. But we all tried what the world suggested to us, what the Hollywood movies yeah. told us, what girls told us, what modern advice told us, what teachers told us, what our parents told us. We actually, all of us gave it a good try. It didn't fucking work. No. It didn't work. <laughs> all of us have gone heartbroken from it. All of us have, have been the little chump who's been texting the girl for three months, who keeps friend zoning him. All of us have been the guy who's texting the girl who says that she'll meet you, but then she doesn't meet you while she's like deep throating some other guy. We, we, <laughs> all <laughs> of us, like, yeah, all of us. <laughs> Not just me. <laughs> Bro, you speak so intensely. Like I was watching, I was clicking on one of your videos and within 50 seconds, I sent them a, a video. I was like <laughs> bursting out laughing, like on my own in my living room, full out laughing. They were like in the first 50 seconds, imagine your girl. Your future wife. <laughs> imagine your future wife. Is <laughs> 
it, it's licking someone's dick right now. And I was like, fucking hell, bro. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> but, but no, man, we, can, we can't handle that image, yeah. bro. It's like terrible. That's why I say it. Yeah. Because you know what? If we don't talk about this like dirty primal stuff of the girl you like, who's just casually getting fucked by some guy who doesn't even care about her. Some, some like quite attractive guy who just sends her a, a, I don't know, some random message on Instagram. And she meets him on the same day. Most girls have had that experience. And it's like, you need to hear it even though it hurts because when you are the complete opposite to that and she's making you wait three months, six months, even though she's had like hookups before and you know, she's saying, oh, you know, maybe I'm not too sure this, whatever, maybe next week. Oh, sorry, can't do next week and stuff. When you hear this gut-wrenching pain that another guy got her in like 24 hours, you need that. You, you need sure. the awareness. And the reason why it hurts, like, you know, I'm, I say these things and so many guys comment like, holy, you know, Hamza just said this. He said this about my future wife. It hurts because you know it's true. You know it's true. And that, that's the, the, the worst part of it is we, we've been sold the lies of what women are like. The modern, like, feminist world has basically told us that women are just kind of like worse men. That's it. Women and men are True, equal. Yeah. Let's go deeper into this. This is interesting. We're equal, but in most measures, men are in the Western materialistic world. In most measures, men are better. So it's like it's very hard to like look at a woman and, and respect her and actually like her in the same way. And in, in, let me tell you a story. Actually, I, I was with a girl, and she she mentioned to me that brown guys like like um, Pakistani, whatever. I'd always treated her with respect, whereas the white guys in her class didn't. And then she asked, like, you know, why do I think that is? And I said, at first, like, when, when you come from a Muslim culture, there's a lot of, like, respect and honor in there. But I said, too, it's like, those Pakistani guys that you know, they're actually genuinely seeing you as a woman. The white guys that you know who've been born and brought up in this, like, feminist nation, they're seeing you as like kind of like a weird equal where you're not equal, but we all have to play the games where like we're the, we're the same, but we're not. So it's kind of strange. And so it's like, if you're the same, you know, if, if you're the same as this white kid, well, he's going to roast you in the same way he roasts his friends, right? He's not been told that you don't do that to a girl. Of course you don't fucking do that to a girl. Like, you know, you don't just randomly call a girl like a dumbass or something when you, you say that with your friends, fine. And so we've basically been just given a handbook that all of us tried, which was like, treat girls the same way that you would with as a guy. And when, now when we look at it, we're all pissed because we're like, how did we fall for that? Of course they're different <laughs> to us. Of course you have to act in a different way. Of course they're like, they're, they're emotional and you just have to like get them into the right emotional state. You don't argue with them with logic. You don't treat them like a man. And it's like, we're all waking up and being like, oh, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> I think that's the biggest mistake, like trying to argue with logic, like as stupid as it sounds, but... Sometimes when a girl comes with a problem or something, she just wants to hear like, okay, it's fine, baby, right? And all men just come straight away like, okay, here's a plaster, fix it. And then, okay, it's over, right? Mm. But that works the complete opposite way of what it should be. Mm. But that's really weird to make that switch from like trying to fix the problem to just yeah. like comforting. And the reason why we try and fix their problems is because if your male friend came over to and asked you about something, you try and fix his problem. We've been told that women and men are the same. And so we... we go through our relationships with women the same way that we would as, as men. If you came to me with a problem, we'd find a solution straight away. It'd be weird if you just wanted me to like listen to you. Like, well, what's the point of that? Like, <laughs> what the hell? Like, let's fix it, come on, bro. Like, True. But if she comes over, like mostly she, she wants you to listen. And honestly, I'll give you like the toxic misogyny, like um, disrespectful advice. You'll almost always do well if you just treat a girl, like a, uh, treat a woman like a little girl. Many girls will say like, oh, I don't like this. That's, that's uh, sexist or whatever. It really, really works. Women love this. Just, just pretend that she's a little girl. She's a five-year-old girl. And when she comes up and cries about what like, you know, her friend Sarah did, are you really going to say like, oh, okay, so like, let, let's fix this. Okay, three. No, you're just going to be like, oh, Sarah's a poo-poo head, isn't she? Let's rock up to Sarah, yeah. Sarah's house. <laughs> throw bricks. But look, you, you treat your girl like, like a little girl, like five-year-old girl. And she's disrespectful towards you. And she says, you're a poo-poo head. What are you really doing to your five-year-old like niece who says that? You're going to be, I'm not a poo-poo head. You're a poo-poo head. No, but like, I think many women will find this disrespectful, I think. But, but, but this is why actually do you think, want. like, what's your point in, why do you think this works? Because it establishes the right dynamic. What, what women say they want and what they actually enjoy are completely two different things. And this is just in general. I'm sure there's women mm -hmm. who genuinely do prefer to be in more of the masculine dominant role. But in a relationship, there are no equals. 
It, there really isn't. There's a there's a dom and there's a sub. The LGBT culture, they actually know this really well. They're, they're acutely aware of this. There's dom and sub. There's, there's um, butch and femme, for example. They, they know this. G- gay people, lesbians, they know this really well. It's straight people who don't. Straight people try and have like an equal between. But there is always someone who's in the dominant, strong position, who's the leader, who makes the decisions. And there's always someone who's in more of the, the submissive. So the dynamics you can have is she is the dominant. So she is the mother figure and you are the son. And that's bad. That's so bad. She's going to be like women in general don't want to be the mother. Like it, some, a lot of guys actually these days want to be the, the son figure, and that's why a lot of like mommy porn is like viral or something. You know, like I remember yeah. when I last used to watch porn like ages ago that like stepmother stuff started to come in, and now I know it's like a completely normal thing. But like that's that's in my opinion the incorrect dynamic. Even though I mean some people might like it, but the the correct or at least the better dynamic that i've had in my life is more of like the father daughter and that's why like like girls want you to to be like this strong man who takes care of everything she doesn't want you to explain and ask her for advice she doesn't want you to like look over her and say like oh what should we do today let's make the plan like oh so you're gonna go do that no it's like a little five-year-old girl she just wants to go on a little adventure so you tell her come on we're gonna go do this thing and we're gonna do this and i've got a surprise for you at 6 p.m and she's like wow like she's a little girl she's so happy <laughs> it's it, it's so easy to be good with girls as long as you strip back the the bullshit and and what i'm saying sounds like so horrible and you know misogynistic or, or um, belittling i urge like the men who who are listening to this just try it just try it on the next date you go to. Just visualize that she's like a five-year-old girl and you're more of the father figure and you're the strong guy who's looking after her and just see the effect that it has. Just try it once because what you're going to see is like you will actually feel amazing, which is very nice for men as well because most men don't even feel good in dating. But she'll literally be sat next to you like a little girl and she's like she's on like a happy adventure. Even though she's like 25 years old, even though she's a professional, many women would love to step into that frame. It's that they've got the bullshit conditioning as well. That was going to be my next question. Like, if the man is more happy in that relationship and the woman is more happy as well, why do you think we've been pushed this this ideology of doing the exact opposite of the thing that makes us happy? I, I feel like there's, you know, maybe conspiracy theories, and it's kind of like the the changing world order, the hard times create strong men. It's like when I, I was reading into the rise of Rome, the rise and fall of Rome. And it seems to me like when, when a nation starts to really push for too much sex and and familiarity between the sexes, like too much time together, that's when it gets weaker. And so, it because it, it sounds amazing, doesn't it? It sounds amazing to say, okay, let's be feminist. Women deserve equal rights. And of course they do. 100% they do. But that was the original like suffragettes movement 100 years ago for equal True. rights. Yeah. In the last like 20 years, it's, it's not about equal rights anymore. Women have far more rights. It, like name one place where women actually have less rights than men. The, the gender pay gap that you've heard about, the 7% one, everyone fucking lied about it. Women, if you account everything, women make more money than men. As soon as you know that that became true, like because women have been doing better and better over the years. As soon as that became true, no feminist has ever w- w- yapped the, the term gender pay gap anymore. You've not heard of it in the last few years. Like five, ten years Since ago. Since COVID, I've heard of it. No. It, was all, it was like such a big thing in high school, in college, whatever. And in the last few years, no one's talked about it. Because the, real, the most latest statistic is women earn more than men. Women perform higher in, than men in every part of the education system. They get accepted into to universities and even jobs in a, basically a discrimination bias and no one talks about it. But just five, ten years ago, when when the statistics were against women, it was a big thing. Now no one wants to talk about it. I think feminism started as an incredibly necessary movement, and it's overstayed its welcome. And I think that it, the problem is now, it still has the the uh, the conditioning in the minds of people. But I, you know what, we are seeing that the. the the change because five years ago we wouldn't have been making this we wouldn't have been speaking about this people weren't no, that aware not. and it was certainly like people were more feminist so five These years days, ago it was still like in the degenerate stuff as well exactly <laughs> so well, you know I, I, the latest statistic i heard is about 50 percent of women don't even uh, acknowledge that they are feminists anymore even women are starting to see like the craziness of it and yeah so because also like i feel like feminism as you said like 100 years ago was perfectly fine and necessary of course but now the lgbtq whatever movement has taken over feminism basically hijacked it and now you see like rainbow flags in schools and stuff so that makes 
the other end, like be very much opposed to to the feminism movement, mm. which might even be worse for women then. So it's very weird how that has hijacked in the last few years. I was also um, like in the papers. They asked me about this last week, and um, a, a big Dutch newspaper. And when I say like stuff like this, like uh, men should be standing up right, like giving a firm handshake right when you come in, you give a very firm handshake. Props to you. Thank you. Like the Donald Trump handshake, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> I think like no. men should be. Oh. <laughs> 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 hi Joe. Hi Joe. <laughs> 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 but, like I said, like men should be honest, standing up right, giving a firm handshake, be saying how it is right, and then they say like, "Oh, well, you're not a women hater then." I was like, no, of course I'm not a women hater. Who the fuck hates women? No one hates women. But they always frame it like that. Like when you say that men are good, they automatically think like that women exactly, are bad. Yeah. But I think it's the exact opposite. Like both when, when you're pro men, you're also pro women. Yeah. It's very weird. You just said something which was so interesting. You said no one hates women. You know what my belief is? The, the modern day feminists, they're the one who hate women because they're pushing women to, to be degenerates, to show their bodies off online. Basically, they're pushing women to do things that harms them. So they're the ones who hate women. If what, like, it, it sounds crazy, like, yeah, they're the enemies, not us. But like, if what we're saying is, is proven to make women happier and healthier, this is the real feminist movement. Is we need to destroy the word feminist and we just need to bring back like feminine women. Feminism is at war with feminine women. If you, like, I don't know if you see this, but on Instagram every now and then I'll I'll get sent reels and it'll be like a, a woman who's like quite feminine and traditional and she's just there with her children or, you know, she's talking about her man or something. And I'll always do one thing. I always click on the comments and there's just so many like bitter modern women just hating on her. Oh, well, you know, your man's gonna just cheat on you. He's gonna do this. He's gonna do this. Or, you know, oh yeah, you're not even that happy. So you just post it on social media or whatever. There's, there's so much like bitterness. And it's like, here's a woman who's like literally just like there playing with a child and people just hating on her. It, I, I really, it sounds weird to say this, but I really think that when you see these like toxic masculinity guys, I, I assume I'm one now because of, of this. Oh, you're the new feminist now. This I'm, is the new feminism. We're going to declare ourselves the new yeah. feminists. And, and if you hate on us, you can't hate on feminists, no, right? You can't, you can't hate women, so we're the new feminists right now. Yeah. Now we're going to hijack the feminism yeah. movement, just like the LGBTQ yeah. community yeah. did. And now we're, <laughs> we, we just declare the new feminism. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. You know, there's a story I want to tell you, actually. There's um, in my gym, there's like a. Asian father, like Pakistani father. And I always speak to him and he's, he's just such a kind gentleman. Every time he sees me, he's like, how's your family? They're all good. And one time I was in the changing rooms and he comes over and he, he had tears in his eyes. And he says, Hamza, I don't know what to do. My little girl came back from school today with the book that she has to read. And it's called Mommy's New Girlfriend. Oh. And she has to read that. And he he's like a Muslim man. He's He's... He's done the right thing. He's still with his woman. They're in love. He's a hardworking guy. He's in the gym every single day. He's a strong, traditional man. He can't even control what's going on in his household. And it, it was like the look of pain in his eyes. It was, it, there was so much pain because I could see like he felt powerless. What, what can he do? Is he going to go and act crazy in front of the school and be the one father who's like you know misogynist or, or transphobic or something? Maybe like that's like social suicide. Probably the only option though. Like probably a lot of other fathers are thinking the same. Yeah. Like I don't want my girl to read this. She probably rally with all the other guys, rock up to the school. I think that's the only solution, you know? You you gotta do something. Because if you don't do anything, it just continues to get worse. Yeah. I I think we all need to stay very respectful. But I think I think a man should have control of his own household, of his children. And this is why I am adamant that I'm going to homeschool my children because there's a few influences like for every man who wants to have children I've done a lot of like autistic thinking about this over the last few years I've done a lot of research right there's a few major influences on your future children there's media there's school and then there's the family media is kind of like TikTok Hollywood movies and stuff if you're already the kind of guy who's on self-improvement and you're not really like doing these things that much then that's actually checked off. Like, are you going to give your kid like an iPad when they're like two years old? Fuck no. No way. Fuck no. No way. Of course not, right? TikTok when they're like five. No. But here's the thing. You're a strong man, right? When your daughter's depressed because she's the loser in school, 
because she's the only one who doesn't know about the newest TikTok 7 or some shit. That's when it's going to start to get harder. When she's asking you for a phone every single day and every other kid her, her age has one and her friends have got them and stuff, that's when it's actually going to be hard for you. So if you want to get rid of like the media influence on your children, you can't do it directly. It's then the school influence we've got to talk about because if your kid is next to other kids in school, that's as bad. So let's, okay, let's, in a perfect world, your, your daughter doesn't have TikTok or even a smartphone, right? But she goes to school. She's next to these degenerates. They're all on TikTok. They're all telling her like, oh, you don't know about that show. Oh, you don't have this shoe. Oh, you don't know this TikTok dance where we like deep throat this, uh, this guy or some shit. <laughs> 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 <You're like laughs> that, but that, imagine that pressure. On the, do you remember being back in like high school and stuff and, and you really care about this, right? You really True, care yeah. about like, like what people think of you and the clothes they wear. Like for example, there was a there was another reel someone sent me where it was like a father giving a gift to his daughter, and she's like, "Oh, is, is that what I think it is? Is that what I think it is? It's a Stanley Cup. It's like a it's like a like a cup basically." Yeah. And she was so excited for it because there's like a TikTok trend where girls are getting them, and that was like she was literally like such a product of marketing, and you wouldn't want your daughter to be that manipulated. But if they're still in school, they're going to see this. Their friends are going to say this. When they're 13, 14, 15 years old and some of the girls have been kissing guys or even having sex with guys and the other girls are validating them and saying, you're so pretty. Wow, your cleavage looks so good and stuff. Your daughter's going to see it. So if you then want to have that level of control as well, you need to consider either some kind of private school, which has your values, but there's not that many that I can see. Or, for example, you consider homeschooling. And then people ask, okay, but what about like the social life in, in homeschooling? The way I see it is, bro, like, what social life did you have in school anyway? You're, you're surrounded by fucking idiots. Yeah, but it's important though, don't you think? It's certainly important. But imagine the social skills your children could develop if you homeschooled them and they had a social skills tutor. But are you gonna like homeschool them yourself or are you gonna do it with a few other friends maybe and then make like a little classroom or what's the plan? Best case scenario, the compound. Imagine there's like five houses, 10 houses all on the same plot of land. And there's a few buildings that you all, it's a, it's a big dream to accomplish. There's a big town hall, there's a school, you bring in the best private tutors, you've got the, all the online classes, all your kids have read like social skills books, how to win friends and influence people. You take them every day to like martial arts clubs. They're the only kids in these clubs who can actually hold eye contact with the adults and actually speak to them. Mm -hmm. Whilst everyone else is saying like, oh, but their social skills will be low. Their children are like eating seed oils, brain dead from TikTok, can't even look people in the eyes. Like they, you know, like, like even young men these days, they'll, they'll get outside your house and then they'll just text you, hey, I'm outside instead of just knocking on the fucking door. That's the social true, skills true. that school <laughs> developed. Like when you think back to your class in school, at least 10 of those kids were mentally disabled. Honestly, <laughs> truthfully, right? Like you just sat there like trying to learn and some kid just slaps you in the back of the head for no reason. <laughs> Other than like, his uncle touches him at home. To like, be fair, I was probably mentally disabled back then as well. So <laughs> that I was, was probably one of the that 10. That was me, bro. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be next to me in class, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think is especially important? Like, did you used to play like uh, football or any kind of like team sport back in the day? A little bit, yeah. I think it's so important. Like football dressing room, nothing's like it. Yeah. Like you get harassed. Get the you, yeah, you get, yeah, get the towel, bro. You get harassed. Like, I always was like the, the weird, like the standout guy because I was tall and had red hair and stuff. Always like uh, yeah, red hair you get picked on. So those guys made me tough, man. <laughs> those guys literally made me like, that I, I, I don't give a fuck. People on TV are telling me like, I don't like this guy or he should be. Some, one time someone on the radio like here told... Um, told that on the radio show that I should be electrocuted on <laughs> on TV. <laughs> I was like, yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> I just didn't care. But if I didn't have like that football dressing room mm. experience, I would be like, oh no, they're telling me I should get electrocuted, what? And I would be like, that's my mom's reaction, you know? Yeah, she still exactly, cares yeah. about the mainstream media and who those people are. But when you see like the actual journalists that are writing the articles, right? Those are always like the biggest dumb fucks mm. of the world. Like you see there, how they're looking, they're like 50 kilos overweight. It's always some stupid guys. Yeah, no one, no one strong hates on you. True. Honestly, with this like new modern day toxic masculinity, canceling culture and stuff. I, I'm on a few news articles as well, which is like, oh, Hamza's toxic misogynist. He said that like women fuck winners. I was, I was looking at the articles like, yeah, they do. Like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. what? <laughs> do you think they fuck losers then? Like, <laughs> Haven't you ever been cancelled or anything? A little bit. I've, I've some, I'm on YouTube and, and that's always been fine. 
Because I know the line to not cross. There's things that like you can't say on there, but I don't give a fuck about saying certain things. And it's like, I'm not going to destroy my entire business to say a certain sentence, right? So YouTube's been fine. Yeah. I've, I've been banned from Instagram, but I made a new account. Mm -hmm. I, there was a gym that I was going to in my hometown, actually. And that this was an interesting story. So there's a gym that I went to. And the the woman who owns it is like a, um, I don't know, like LGBT, whatever, right? But I was nothing but respectful. I, I trained there. I trained hard. I trained at the same time every morning. And it was only me and another woman who was there. And I went seven days in a row, right? And the owner trained me herself. We actually had bonding moments where she taught me to do like this certain exercise and everything. And I was there every day. In fact, she put me on her Instagram and it's me being a gentleman. Me and this other woman were running towards the, the door and I like let her go in first. Right? It's like just, I was, I was nothing but respectful. Never said anything to anyone. And she finds my YouTube channel. She finds a video where I talked about like quitting porn. And she sends me this message saying like, oh, we've banned you from my gym because we don't allow peddlers of toxic masculinity and men who have problems with wanking over like porn. And I was, the first what? thing I thought was like, wait, you don't allow men who have problems with porn. You'd have to ban every single man in your fucking gym, first of all. But second, it's like, where's the toxic masculinity? Like, where is it? Like, I actually kind of foresaw, and it, it's just weird because it's like the people who talk a lot about diversity and acceptance are actually not, accepting of another gender, which is just masculinity. They're not accepting at all. I, I was nothing but polite, kind, respectful, nothing at all. Never, never once looked at anyone weird, never said anything at all. Even the video she watched as well, it was a guide on willpower. It was a guide on like becoming a better man to resist porn. And that's why she canceled you from the gym. Yeah. Crazy. How bad is it? And, and you know what the, the interesting thing is? I can ruin her business. I could just take a screenshot of that, post it online, put a link to her, her gym and get her like, what, thousand one-star reviews on Google. I could ruin her business forever. And I didn't. I never have to any of these people who have done th this kind of stuff. Definitely. I never have. And it's like, I, I see this with like Tate and other people who've been canceled. It's weird that like the world thinks that they're crazy, evil, horrible men. Tate has so much influence. Any business he wanted to ruin right now, he could just post the link to like, I don't know, Airbnb's review app because they banned him, right? And tell everyone to rate them one star. Never done anything like that. It's like the, the toxic masculine guy that's getting hated on. We're displaying an incredible lack of character here. And, and it, it's just a shame that people don't see that and they just see you as like some evil guy. Like you said, people just like, the moment you talk about some traditional characteristics of strength people just think you're sexist straight away it's and like they you think you hate women like yeah. actually yeah, hate them exactly. like you wake up and think oh my god i don't yeah, like women like, like no this is it's the exact opposite thing. bro the stupidest <laughs> why do you think world? i've got so much muscle bro yeah. i love women bro <laughs> <laughs> why do you think i did five thousand workouts like, <laughs> i really think like toxic masculinity is just being a gentleman yeah it really is i've been saying this if you don't get called toxic masculinity if you don't get called like toxically masculine you're probably not masculine enough. You know you're at the right level when that's how people see you. And th that's how like, let's say the wrong people see you. The right people, what I've found is when I've pushed into those toxic levels, that's when I've gotten respect from the best m men and interestingly from the most beautiful and also the most respectful women as well. Like the, the women who have been into me since I've become toxic masculine have been on a completely another level with not just beauty, because that's, that's really nice, but it's like just the level of respect that they have and how much they, they like me and how much effort they put in. Before this, before I was ever like toxically masculine, it was like, in the UK we have this, I'm not sure if it's probably still the same, but it's, it, there's always a game in UK, in British dating, where you have to be kind of like emotionally uninvested Basically, Western dating is just I think that's everywhere, like, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, you, you probably have it here where it's like, you pretend like you don't like each other. It's like a negotiation almost, right? And the one who is most prepared to walk away wins. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and it's such a toxic, because it's like, it's the opposite. We, we need more of a bond together, but we don't have that. And the girls I used to attract when I was just more of a normal guy, you know, I went to the gym and stuff, but I wasn't like seen as this toxic guy or this masculine guy. It was girls who, who, who weren't respectful, it was girls who I felt anxious and insecure and overthinking like next to. I didn't have a good time with them. And interestingly, they didn't even have a good time with me. And it was, you know, girls who didn't really like me much and, you know, they wouldn't see me much. Since I became what women are supposed to hate, I've attracted more women than ever. And, and true, I don't say that as a player, but truthfully, like the best women, truthfully, like amazing, like really like just 
like high quality men and women have come into my life now that have become more masculine. And I've, it's common sense because I'm a stronger man because mm -hmm. I take care of people because I can look at you in the eyes. Imagine five years ago, I'd be a little bitch. I wouldn't have hand, like handshaked you properly. I wouldn't have spoke to your boys. I would have come in late or something. It, it's been, it's done nothing but positive, even with the cancellations and like small things here, getting banned from this gym, whatever. Becoming toxically masculine is one of the best things I've ever done in my life. And if, if that, that makes me like an evil person, it's like, you, you can believe that. Preach, but, I agree. Yeah. 100% agree. Here's the thing. What do you think about the whole thing that Tate's saying, like to have multiple wives and stuff? What's your opinion on that? I've thought about this a lot, you know. I think, I think certain men are probably not supposed to be monogamous. I think Tate, one of the, he doesn't explain this so well. I think it's, he's talking for himself. Problem is millions of guys absorb what he says. And so they start thinking the same thing. On average, a man probably is better being monogamous and just having one really great woman. There's certain men who just can't be in that situation. I might be one of them. I've seen this in my father as well. It's like, when I get into a committed relationship, I turn into like just a weak little like idiot, basically. Like I, I slack on everything. I, I wish I was one of those guys who, when I get into a committed relationship, my life gets better, but it doesn't. Like, and it's so interesting. Why not? Why do you think that is? I have a huge level of desire and motivation from women and feminine energy. It's like one woman isn't kind of enough for that. And and I wish it was because it'd just be easier and you'd be able to have this amazing, secure, loving relationship. But when I've gotten into like really deep relationships, I fall off. I'm not even as nice anymore. I'm not as kind anymore. But why not? Like why not? What's the reason? Interest, variety. It's like, imagine you're just living like an inauthentic life. Imagine ev every day you're, you're wearing pants that you don't like, but everyone else is telling you like, oh yeah, but that's good for you. No, but it's your girlfriend, right? So you liked her in the first place. Of course, yeah. But look, so let me, let me explain it to you, right? So okay. when I met my girl in 2022, I'm going to the gym aggressively. I'm flirting with girls on the streets. Girls are in my DMs and stuff. I feel like the man. Every day I'm meeting someone who's like a fan of me. I, it's all awesome. One year later, we've lived together for like nine months straight. And I went from being that sort of like, sounds kind of cringe, but you know, like feeling like an alpha male, basically, right? I went from that to the goofy farting boyfriend who's leaving like poo-poo stains <laughs> in the toilet. That, that's the problem. Like, why, did, why, why didn't you just stay the alpha guy then? When, I think in general, but especially for, for certain men, if, I think if you get too close to a woman, it, it it dulls your blade. I think th this is a question which I find so interesting. I asked this to a, a student actually recently and I said, what percentage of your time would you spend uh, in your dream life would you spend alone with men and with women? Because you might find it's actually completely different from what you actually spend. So most guys, for example, if we had, if we asked them, okay, what percentage of your time are you currently spending alone? What would they say? Like 70, 80%? A lot, right? yeah. yeah? With friends, maybe maybe like 5%, some guys zero, maybe some guys like 20. And with girls, any guy who's single would most likely say about zero, maybe 1%. Any guys who are in a, in a relationship might actually say about 80%, 90% if they live together, right? And if we ask you, let's, let's say if you answer this question, in your ideal life, what percentage of your time would you be in solitude? Probably around 50%. 50. And with men? 25. And with women? 25, yeah. Is that how it is right now? No, right now I'm way more solitude. Yeah. Like I just had that season of no, and um, the lonely chapter. The lo <laughs> lonely chapter. Yeah, I just I just had that. So we started a new business, and when you start a new business, you really have to put the work in, right? So just spending 12 hour days behind the laptop and terrible. But yeah, 50, 25, 25 would be ideal, I think. Perfect. Yeah, mine yeah. mine's quite similar as well. When you get into a relationship where you live together, it's very easy for that last one to go up to like 75 percent, and then only 25% solitude and like 0% with guys. That's what, like the kind of guy I am. Three relationships, I found myself in the exact same situation where I just stop hanging out with friends. I stop being me. And so with me and my girl, like we, we, we lived together for a long time. And earlier this year in um, January, we moved back. I moved back home, she moved back home. 
in Dubai or UK? No, I, I moved to my family home, right? So you moved back from U Dubai to the UK now. We were in Scotland at first, like so. Basically, we moved all over. We were in Dubai, then we went to Bali, then we went to Scotland, and we ah, lived okay. in Scotland for a few months. And so, and it wasn't good. It was like the I've got nothing bad to say about her at all. Cause she's a wonderful girl, but it was just our relationship and and as individuals, we were both deteriorating. And it, it was it was a very like agitating mode because both of us wanted to grow. She she wanted to like get better in fitness. I wanted to do better in business, but we just weren't able to do that. And we were looking at each other every day saying like, is this even working? Like, you know, we spend so much time together. We're, we're, we're not as like sexual with each other. We're not as polarized. The day we both moved home separately and I'm back at my, my place. I've had a spring in my step every single day. It's so much that like, I remembered who I was again. Some men, it's like, I feel like they prosper when they're very, very close to their women. And some men don't. Some men live more of that detached life. Tate is like that. So I believe Tate it's doesn't very interesting. Like, like, Why do you think that is that you prosper when you, when you move back home instead of with your girl? Who knows, honestly? Because I, I wouldn't even say genetics because my, bro my brother's one of those guys. Since he, he got married and he lives with his wife, He's become like a, a like a gentleman. Like he he's become such a powerful, hardworking man. So he works it with my business as well. He's working like literally right now, all day, every day. He works like like an immigrant, like I do. Hardworking man. And and the best thing is he is so loving and polarized with his woman. And now I, I've known this guy obviously all my life, but like he was a dick a few years ago. He was like you know just aggressive and everything. Since he got married, he's become like like a gentleman to, to the entire family, like a. a like a, a masculine, strong man. And it's amazing to see your own brother develop like that. And so he's prospered whilst living with his woman. And that's amazing for him. I've lived with, with two girls. And for both, it's like, I haven't. When I live alone and I'm quite detached from women and I'm almost like quite more like mysterious and I'm not spending all day with them, not, certainly not living with a woman. That's when I'm actually at my best. And interestingly, that's when women like me the most as well. That's when I'm I'm most desirable. So I can't even say anything like bad about my girl. Like um, living with her was like, it was fun and stuff. It's just not the life that I, I want to live. Like for my dream life, I'd honestly spend maybe five to 10% with girls. Honestly, yeah. I'd, I'd spend maybe 25 by myself. Wake up, a few hours of work on the business. You don't want people around you. And then the rest of the day, I want to be around guys. I want to just banter. I want to laugh about shit. I want to like go hit some workouts and you know just run or something and like military style boot camps, like training camps in in I don't know like back in the old days or something. Because I, I feel like like look, the warrior and the goddess, they're not supposed to spend that much time together. If you imagine like what, whatever you can imagine for like the old days back in like times of like Roman Empire or when we used to battle with swords, the warrior gets sent out to the training camp and he just trains there full time with his men for weeks. War's about to start and he's got 24 hours to go back home. He walks in through his little hut and his goddess is waiting for him right there. His woman's waiting. And they have like the most polarized, like energetic relationship because it's only 24 hours. Just like, it's a bit like vulgar, but like imagine how wet she's gonna be. Imagine how hard he's going to be. That is, that's how man and woman should be. He's just been off on his mission and she's been waiting. She's been yearning for him. And they reunite at this moment. And the reason why it's so special is because he has to go to war tomorrow. And so when he goes, she yearns for him again. And he goes again with his men. He might return, he might not. How do you see the modern translation of this then? Like, how do you go to war, go to the legionnaire camp? Going to your nine to five on, uh, <laughs> on, on the Roman uh, war front. How do you see this in the modern world? I think Tate does this really well. This is me speculating because I don't know like the ins and outs of his relationship. But from what I know, he doesn't live with his wife or with his children. He lives with his brother and, and his wife and children aren't in the same house, which means that he keeps up like a huge level of like mystery and masculine brotherhood for, for his like triple thing is like, he, I, I assume maybe he spends five, 10% of his time with his woman most of his time with his brother and then maybe a little bit of time in solitude. And so it's like his going to war is like, for example, like this, like going to the podcast, it's like you leave a girl at home and it's like, oh, I've got hands to shake. I've got this business meeting. I've got this thing. So your girl's like actually waiting for you. And I, like, imagine, imagine my girl thinking about me right now. What's he doing? Who's he with? Oh, he looks sexy. He sent me a picture of this. This is okay. Imagine if I didn't go on the trip. Imagine if I was just there, just like, you know, loud farts in the toilet. 
it's not going to be the same effect. People these days tell you like, oh, you know, like I just want to spend all t- all my time with with girls, and maybe you do, maybe that's nice. But for me, and and I've noticed for certain guys, th- nobody wins. My goals don't win, so I'm not happy. I'm not happy, so she's not even happy. I'm not working to my goals in the same sort of aggressive pursuits, so she's not even getting the best version of me. And so, and my business isn't even like prospering either. So who, who wins when when a certain kind of man gets too close? So what, so to relate this to your question about monogamy. Some men will do amazing in monogamy, in getting married, having a house, and then raising the children just like that. Amazing. Other men, I think, if they put themselves in that situation, they'll they'll be like a, a trapped animal and they'll always have to rein it in. And after 10, 20, 30 years, it's like, can you always trap that part of you that, that feels like this isn't authentic? So I saw this with my father. I think I'm more like my father, like um, in terms of dating than my brother is, where... He was, I think he was a bit of a player before he met my mother. Like he traveled around the world. He's a very good looking guy, like masculine as fuck. He'd ride around on his motorbike with no helmet and everything. A strong man, right? And when he married my mother, it's like, he wasn't able to stay faithful. And here's a guy who's the hardest working man that I know who's worked like brutal labor, immigrant style jobs, 12 to 16 hours a day, no days off for 20 years to support our family. And my mother's like a stay at home mother. It's like a traditional thing, right? So he's a hardworking, disciplined man. He wasn't able to stay faithful. Wouldn't it be like very virtuous to stay faithful to one woman? I honestly don't know, you know. I, I used to think that. And I think, what, what if that isn't the authentic part of you? What if the, the normal, like natural part of you is just not aligned to that? We say it's virtuous because certain men prosper in that and those men tell you like, oh, you know, it's so much better with just one woman, just one woman. And for them, it, yeah, it certainly is. Like if you've, you know, engaged in a lot of casual sex and you're one of these guys and you get with one woman, it's amazing, it's the best thing ever. But there's guys who do that and their whole life goes downhill, their relationship goes downhill. So it's like, it is what's virtuous for one man is not the same for another. I think what's important, and I said this to the student I was speaking to, actually I said to him is, you need to live your life according to your values, not what society preaches. So society is pre- like a lot of like, you know, the space right now is like monogamy, non-degeneracy. It, it, um, a lot of guys are becoming Muslim, for example. And that's amazing. If that's part of your values, that's amazing. But if it's not and you're living like this inauthentic life and you're basically, like you became a Muslim because Tate's a Muslim, for example, or you're, you're dating a, a woman seriously because your family positively reinforce it, nobody's winning. Because if you're in there like, oh yeah, I don't even like my life. I don't even like this girl, but like, yeah, my family's happy. It's like, they notice that you're not as happy. And and how long are you going to play this game for 10, 20 years? If you're one of these guys who just struggle with just having one girl and it's a struggle when you're just kind of dating her, how long are you, like, are you lasting in that situation before yeah, not you long. So it's Not it, long, yeah. It, like, I, I wish I could say to you, like, I wish I could prosper in that because it's so simple. It's like you, you just I think move I, in. I'm more like that, I think. Yeah. yeah. Which, which I don't think there's yeah. anything right or wrong. I just think it's like, I think men should live the life that, that feels aligned to their own values. And so I, I know amazing guys who are married with children, live with their wives, and it's like the best thing that they've done for their, for their business, their mental health, their, their love life, everything. I think that's amazing. I think that's, that's like so wholesome and, and so powerful for a man. But I think there's other guys who just like, if they get into that, nobody wins. Even like, for example, their children won't, won't win. Like this is the case with my father. It's like, imagine trying to rein in that animal for 20 years straight. You're, you're not living a great life. Your wife notices, your children notice. Certain men, like, like it sounds weird, but they should maybe take a consideration and ask themselves like, could I actually not cheat over 20 years? Yeah, but here's the thing, like, che- it's not, it's called cheating for a reason, right? <clears throat> and what I also think is an interesting question to ask you is, what do you think about um, male versus female body count? So for example, I'm guessing you want your your woman to have a low body count. Yeah, but you're also saying, like, you can go cheat and... Oh, no, no, I've, sorry, I'm, I'm not saying you should go cheat. I, I no, but like some men like have that desire in them, right? Yeah, what do you yeah. think about that dynamic? <clears throat> so... Yeah, me, me, look, if you make an agreement with a woman and you, you have a discussion and you say we're together, then you shouldn't cheat. Che- Tate said this once, and I completely, I, I get what he's doing, but I completely disagree. It's like, men, you should, no one should cheat. If you've made a promise to someone, that the whole point is you keep the promise. The, the idea that I think Andrew Tate said, which a lot of people talk, is like, 
he said like, oh yeah, men can cheat and should cheat. What he's really saying is like, you shouldn't have entered a monogamous relationship anyway, or he shouldn't have, right? But if you're in a monogamous relationship, you made the promise to your girl, that your girlfriend, boyfriend and stuff, then yeah, obviously don't cheat. It's part of keeping your word, so that's important. But in terms of male and female body counts, yeah, my students asked ask me about this recently, actually, there's so much I can say. So it's been shown that the more men that a woman has slept with, particularly the men who have then left her life, there is damage that's left. And the statistics show like it increases her chance to divorce you and to cheat on you by like 10% by every for guy that's, yeah, for every guy that she sleeps with, okay. which is brutal. So it's quite a lot, yeah. yeah. And th like, if I could show you, show you the bar graph, it'd be easier. But basically if you imagine a bar graph and it shows her, her chances of cheating on you or divorcing you, when she's had zero sexual partners before you, so you marry her, you take her virginity, the bar is completely like very low. It's like one or two percent. As soon as she's had one guy before you, it jumps up significantly. I forgot what the number is, maybe 10, whatever. Then when it goes to about four, that's when it's fairly high. It's unfortunate that it's like that low because these days you meet girls, you slept with 10 guys, 20 guys. It's like a normal thing now. But about four guys. is like... Broken out. Come, come to UK, bro. That's Fucking like hell, that, bro. That, guys. that's like the, the highest quality woman in UK, bro. <laughs> yeah, and it, it jumps up considerably. And when it gets past about like ten, that's when it kind of diminishes a bit. But it's like that bar's too high. Along with this, there's also marital satisfaction as well. Basically, how happy she's going to be. So when women sleep with men, even if it was in the past, whatever, whatever, it's like they're literally permanently less happy, particularly in a relationship. So if you're a good man, let's say you're a Muslim, you're waiting for marriage and your woman has slept with just one man before you, she's going to be about 10 times more likely to cheat on you. Now the, the percentage at first was quite small. And if she slept with only one guy, the percentage still is quite small, it's like 10%. But it's like, wh like, why would you take that risk? And also emotionally as well, like psychologically, it's like, it hurts men. It really hurts men. For, for women, not as much. Women, a, a lot of women, particularly traditional women, they'll know that a powerful man is going to have a high body count. They'll, they'll just know it, they'll assume it, and they won't even like think anything of it. For men, it's the complete opposite. For a man, if you know even like she slept with one guy before you and you love her, it will hurt you. There's lots of guys who will say to girls like, oh, I don't care, you can sleep with guys. No, 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 no. We're talking about a guy who loves you. Like all women should hear this. If a man loves you, he will be heartbroken to know that you've even like kissed a guy before him. Any guy who says to you otherwise, like directly to speaking to the women, it, he doesn't love you. Any man who actually loves you, he will actually have like a gut pain knowing that you've been around, that you like, you know, you've, you've been texting other guys and everything. It, it's brutally painful. And interestingly, it's not the same thing with, um, with women looking towards men. Most women, if they know that a guy is like hooked up with a girl before, they don't feel the same way. And the reason why is because again, it's like, we're not the same. When, when a woman, look, I think it's, it's gonna be common sense to say, women are more vulnerable to the consequences of casual sex than men. Of course they are. It's just as simple as that. Now, men, I, I, I believe they still have problems with casual sex. I think that's like being a degenerate, going out, taking drugs, hooking up with some girl yeah, that what's you don't like know. The, like, do you also have like the percentages for what happens when a man sleeps with lots of other girls or stuff? I don't, I don't know the exact percentage. I, okay. From what I, someone, I. Or the effects know, or something. I don't know how accurate yeah. this is. I just remember someone commented on, on the same post that I'd saw this and they said, it's kind of a similar trend, but just a lot less significant for men as well. So for example, a man who slept with zero women, he's far less likely to divorce or cheat than a man who slept with 100. Of course, we're going to see that, that trend. It just seems to be more significant with women. What do you think is like the ideal combination then? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Honestly, zero zero. It, it, like, but here's the thing, like, that's the ideal scenario. And that's what, you know, so many guys are getting into like um traditionalism, Islam, Christianity, being faithful, not being degenerate, and they're saying, okay, zero zero. This is what I I was saying to someone recently. I said, it doesn't really work like that anymore. Again, let, let's visualize like the perfect Muslim man. He's 19 years old. He's been really, you know, hardworking and everything. And he's going to get like an arranged marriage, right? Now, 100 years ago, he's a virgin. His wife's a virgin. Amazing. They're, they're going to stay together till they die. Amazing relationship. He's a virgin right now. 
His parents bring in this woman who's who's um, high quality. She's a virgin as well. Okay, sweet. Oh, amazing. Hamza was wrong, right? Within a few years, he sees the text. He hears from her friends. She sucked multiple guys off. This is what, like, th- this is the Bro. problem. With, with, with <laughs> Honestly, this is, like, what a lot of religious guys don't want to hear. A, a Western woman, a sort of, let's say, a normal non-religious girl, it's quite easy to tell their body count. They'll go on a date and they'll fucking tell you. Oh, so I was with this one guy. Like, they'll fucking tell you what their body count is, right? With religious girls, you've got to be extra careful. And this is the problem then. If you're a religious man and you don't have much experience with wo- girls, you don't have that intuition, you might miss out on the signs where your, your like virgin wife has actually hooked up with guys before. There's like, they're good at it as well. Because again, let's think about- Sounds like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> Imagine the West, like the, the normal Western woman, not not yeah. religious, right? She hasn't had to hide it, right? So she's not going to hide it from you. Imagine, let's say there's a, a Muslim girl for, in the UK. She was born there, but she's Muslim because of her parents and stuff, right? She's had to hide it, any kind of dating experience from her parents already. She's used to hiding it. So she's already good at that. So that's that's like something Fair like point. like religious guys really, I, I want them to just be careful. Because if you don't have some experience with women... You won't pick up on it. When you've had experience with women, you can kind of look at a girl and almost straight, like within one conversation, tell. You exude a personality, but girls just tell you like their, their past experiences. Imagine that same Muslim man who exudes the kind of personality where girls aren't going to tell him the truth. And, and imagine that reality then, thinking that you've married this amazing woman. And you can't fucking divorce now. You don't, you don't get fucking divorced in these cultures, right? So you just have to live with that, right? And so there's a brutal reality. So this is what I've been, it's a few Muslim guys have asked me because I've been saying recently, like get a little bit of experience, date women, go on dates, speak to girls. And they say like, oh no, but it's haram. And I said, okay, listen, don't even have sex with them. Just get into conversations. If you get into like 500 deep, that's not haram. You get into 500 deep conversations over the next few years. Go on a walk with a girl. That's fine. Don't even hold hands. Don't even be intimate. Just go on like a walk with 100 girls. Get into a conversation just so you can kind of learn things. You'll be able to pick up certain like mannerisms. You'll be able to pick up how to flirt. And also you'll just like be more comfortable around women. So when you actually meet your wife, you'll be good at it as well. Because the worst thing that could happen is you get into a committed relationship and you realize like your woman's not as you expected. And that would be, that would be a terrible, terrible life to be in. True. Gut wrenching, as you said. Like you actually feel the... The pain in your stomach. Yeah, yeah, that's terrible. So we didn't even get to the second quote yet. That was that was like the first wow. quote. <laughs> 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 that was the first quote. <laughs> so the second one is a bit more um, about like mindset and stuff. So drastically decrease instant gratification. Delay the few good pleasurable things, the things that you want to do right now, but make your life worse in the long run. Please expand on that. Yeah. Instant gratification are the things that feel good right now, but make your life worse later. This is like porn, video games, junk food, drugs. Delayed gratification are the things that are usually harder and uncomfortable right now, but your life is better later because of it. Exercise, meditation, sleeping right, spending time with good quality people. We live in an instant gratification world where everyone just expects pleasure instantly. Men used to have to work hard to become eligible for a woman's love. Now they can just go onto Instagram, OnlyFans, Pornhub, and get that. You used to have to work hard to get status and brotherhood in the army or recognition from other men in your career. Now you can go and get that in Call of Duty when you've got like the, the gold prestige gun or something. But what do you think is actually wrong with like porn? I know it's wrong, but yeah. please explain the actual points why it's wrong. Okay. There's a few reasons. Number one, dopamine. When you watch porn, it spikes up your dopamine and then it goes below the baseline afterwards. Dopamine is kind of like your feeling of motivation. So if we take this hypothetical young man and he watches porn first thing in the morning, he'll feel kind of good. He'll have this desire, but he'll have less desire, less motivation through the day. So he's less likely to feel like going to the gym. Now, he could still be super disciplined and go anyway, but truthfully, the kind of guy who's watching porn is usually not that disciplined. So if you're watching porn consistently, you'll just be less motivated to study, to work hard, to like look good, to exercise, to 
um, I don't know, work on your business, speak to new people. You'll just have less motivation. Which like, and how much would you pay? Let, let's say for the rest of your life, how much would you pay for five percent more motivation in everything you do? I don't know, a lot, like um, fifty grand or something. Easily, yeah, M maybe more. Easy. Honestly, yeah. five percent more motivation just permanent. That's porn, basically. If you watch porn a few times a week, you've just lost that five percent. So it, it, that's one one big reason you you lose motivation for other things. Two, it, it damages your relationship and sexual ability. There's so much practical stuff. When you're jerking off with your hand, more and more you'll start squeezing tighter. That's called like the, the death grip. And there's problems now with guys where when they eventually ha have sex with a woman, they've been practicing like with a like tighter grip of their hand. And so they lose the erection whilst having sex with a girl. So my, that's just, I don't know, I just that's find crazy. that's brutal, isn't it? Imagine like yeah. not being able to get hard with a girl because your hand is tighter than she is. Like that's, that's <laughs> fucking. I've never thought about that. Me, that's I've fucked. never heard like, that before. That's crazy. And th there's more, then there's like, let's say the, the tolerance as well. Mm -hmm. When we all started jacking off, it was, it was pictures, right? For most guys who were like our age, it's like we, we looked at pictures first when we were like 12, 13 years old. Then by, by the time you're like 10 years later, you got like four tabs open. It's like a, a music video that's been edited to the beat and there's like a little strobe light <laughs> at the bottom or some shit. There's like porn shorts or some shit. It's like tic shorts. TikToks or something. Okay. You, you go from, it's like it's like a drug basically. You go from needing the smallest hit, which is like even a clothes picture of a girl. I don't know when you were like 13. I, I, I was looking at co clothes pictures of like celebrities. I was jacking off to that. That's that more than enough for me. And then you go on to like this, this, Dirty, degenerate, multiple tabs, compilations and everything, right? So it's like that that increases your tolerance. And when you yeah. increase your tolerance for any kind of drug, what happens? The negativity, the withdrawal symptoms are higher as well. Then there's also like your ability to bond with a woman as well. You've, you've looked at a thousand women who are naked, who are in the perfect angle, who are moaning in the right way, who, you know, whose bodies are moving perfectly. You've, you've clicked on videos of redheads, of brunettes, of blondes, of thick girls, skinny girls, everything. And then when you've got your woman in front of you, it's like, she doesn't look that great anymore. So this is, this is what a, like a real woman looks like. And, and imagine that, it's like, here's, here's your woman that you could have bonded with, that you should be like so in love with. And you can't help, even if you're trying not to, you can't help but to be slightly dissatisfied because she doesn't have as, like, as big titties as you've been watching on, on um, these videos. So it's, it's quite lethal. It's like three ma major problems with porn that so many young guys are struggling with. And um, yeah, it's brutal. And, and in fact, you know, the, the final one I'll say is it's just the self-image as well. Because now loads of guys know about the problems of porn, that it's bad for them, but they keep fapping, they keep watching porn. That brings a lot of shame to your mind. Like when you, when you there's a bad habit that you know is a bad habit, but you keep doing it because of addiction. You feel like an idiot. Like you start to really dislike yourself. So this is for most guys in my space right now that they, they want to get onto NoFap, but they keep relapsing. And so they actually feel worse since having discovered NoFap than before. Because before it was like, you know, there was these hidden things that they didn't know about, but it was just like, whatever, it's just normal. When you discover NoFap and you discover the problems with porn, but you're still addicted, that's when you actually feel like it's such a gremlin. You, you start hating yourself because you're like, oh, I've done it again. I've done it again. I've done it again. Yeah, but that's when you like take action, right? That dissatisfaction yeah. causes the, the progress, but it, there's a bit of that transition period. So for a few months, if you're still watching porn and you know, you're know you struggling to kind of reduce it or to quit, your self-image is all fucked up. Like you go outside and if you do this today, for every guy watching this, do this today, just go outside and just look at every man you walk past and just ask yourself this question. Do you think he fapped this morning? You'll be able to tell with quite high accuracy or like, let's say the, like yesterday, you'll be able to tell. It's like, it, it, it makes you move and act and look a certain way. And it, it makes you look like, a feel, you know, just feel like a god. Bro, you've got the craziest like, like examples. <laughs> <stuff>. <laughs> Looking around, like, like, touching his dick. <laughs> like, but it's, it's so true. Like, just, just do this when you okay. go, go out later. And you'll literally, you'll see guys and you'll be like, yeah, I can tell. And, and there might be an exception. You might be wrong about some guy, but you'll, you'll be able to tell. And here's the thing. Everyone can tell. Girls can tell. So when there's a young guy who's struggling with porn and he goes uh, into school and he's fat that morning, they can tell, they can fucking tell. And not only that, your parents can tell. So you exuberate like the- Neediness, like you know, just dirty goblin yeah. energy. Your dirty parents have, have yeah. smelt it. 
like young guys ask me like, oh, you know, my parents don't believe in my dreams. I want to be a YouTuber. I want to get into business, but they want me to get into university. I was like, bro, I don't believe in you either. You don't even believe in yourself. Your room smelled like cum for 10 years. Of course your parents don't believe you. You've literally smelt like semen and they've smelt it every day when they've walked into your room. And now you're telling them like, oh yeah, guys, I'm going to be a millionaire. Like, yeah, I wouldn't believe you either. So it's like, it, it makes people just lose respect of you. Because if there's one act of the loser of, this sounds cringe, but like the beta male, what is it? It's jacking off. That's the, the one perfect act which symbolizes being a beta and not being like a winner, being the loser. Touching your peepee because you can't get a girl instead. Very true, very true. It's also very true that you said, like, your parents don't believe in you, I'm going to go to university, blah, blah, blah. And then all these guys fall basically for the, the Iman Gazi content online or Tate content, or I make some content like that as well. And they all, they all are like, okay, I'm going to drop out of school, start a business, blah, blah, blah. My parents don't believe me. But they haven't had any, like, um, previous, mm. how, do, how do you say it in English? Like, uh, reputation. Reputation yeah. or anything. Nothing accomplished. Yeah. Like, you've got to do it first and then open your mouth. But most of the guys, they open their mouth first and then they try everything and they fail at everything because you're always going to have that cycle, right? You start, you have a lot of optimism, mm. then you try it, yeah. it goes all the way down because you see, fuck, this is actually what's, hard. What's that called? In um, Crisis of Meaning. Or in, yeah, it's also from it? Rosie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah, it goes down, then you're like, <laughs> informed pessimism. Yeah, first, what, yeah. first you have in uninformed optimism. Yeah. So you go in there, yeah, man, I'm going to do day trading. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. I'm going to make a million dollars a day. Then you go day trading and you see, okay, fuck, this is actually really fucking hard. Then, it goes down. then you go down to uh, informed pessimism, then everyone drops out. Then they go to the first place again, you say, oh, I'm going to start drop shipping. Yeah, I'm going to make $2 million <laughs> a day. <laughs> uninformed optimism, <laughs> drop out again. And then just complete that cycle. But you got to push through it and keep, uh, keep going. And then you'll really have a business. I have a, a story about this, you know. So I was the same. I was a fapper, yeah. video gamer, eating junk food, skinny little weak young guy right and when i moved back home after that period i told you where you know i was smoking weed and everything i moved back knowing that i was going to take business and fitness and self-improvement seriously so i got onto a dopamine detox where basically i just refused to do bad habits i lived like i was in the military i wrote down what i would do for every minute of the day and i was just literally obsessing over it it was, it was like on my notes and i just kept on reading the same thing 6 a.m wake up 7 a.m do this 8 a.m do this I trimmed all my hair off and I start waking up at 5, 4.30 before my dad even wakes up. He needs a taxi driver, so he wakes up early. They see this for a few days, for a week, for two weeks. My parents see, okay, he's not a bitch anymore. His room doesn't smell like cum anymore. He wakes up and he has a cold shower and he um, makes his bed. My mom asks me like, oh, it's raining. Like you, you, um, you don't want to go to exercise right now, do you? And I'm like, no, 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 I, I want to go because it's raining. She looks at me like I'm a psychopath. Few days later, when they ask me, like, oh, David so Gogan's effect, exactly. Well, then they asked me, "What do you want to do with your life?" And I looked to them and said, "I'm going to be a YouTuber." The next day, I woke up with 18 new subscribers because they had sent my channel to everyone that they knew, everyone from Pakistan in in the village, in our farms, and everything. Every day, there's a new comment, like, "Hey, Hamza, like, I, I'm from your um, village in Pakistan. Your your dad sent a link. It's very good. I, I crossed like a hundred subscribers that day." My family believed in me because I gave them a reason to. So when a young guy asked me, like, oh, you know, my parents don't believe in me. I want to be a business. I want to do this. It's like, make them believe you then. Do so, Like, work hard, sure. But do it with your fitness as well. Wake up earlier than your father and be hitting push-ups outside in the rain when he fucking sees you. And do that two weeks in a row, three weeks in a row. Do it four weeks in a row. Go and get a six-pack. You're, you're sat there with 20% body fat. I wouldn't believe you if you, said, if you told me anything other than you're going to go eat a cake today. The guys can't respect you, right? If you if you don't take care of yourself, you're like looking all sloppy, you got clothes on your floor, you got that old water bottle like underneath your desk you haven't even picked up for weeks. Of course, no one's gonna believe you. You, you don't even believe yourself. You, you might say, oh, I'm gonna be a millionaire. You don't even believe it yourself. When I say like that moment, I said, okay, I'm gonna go home and get onto self-improvement. I believed and I made it happen every single day, even though it was difficult, even though it took like it took my soul away from me. I had to kill myself. That version of me needed to die to create this new version. That's why I made the, the Adonis Protocol. It's kind of like this like self-improvement plan for young guys. Because I kept on seeing like, you know, there's so many self-improvement videos out there. I've made over a thousand and I wanted one place to send guys. And I thought to myself, like it's like a three hour protocol of like, what would I get younger me to do? So he made this progress, but in half the time. And it's the most important thing step by step. It's like basically a way of becoming reborn. 
And one of the things is changing your identity and your look, grabbing the trimmer and t- taking all of your hair off, even your... your is that part of the protocol as well? That's it. It's like, so do this, take your hair off Exactly. Now. So really? every day, the guys in the group, they're, they're posting like, oh, I've just done the buzz cut. Guys, I'm not sure if I want to do the buzz cut. I've got cute, like you've got like a cute hair styled and stuff. I don't, want, I don't know if I want to do it. And I'm always telling them the reason why. It's not because it's going to make you look good. It's because every day you're going to see yourself in the mirror and realize, oh, damn, yeah, I'm doing this. We're serious. Yeah. You need that. We're all in. Why do they do that in the military? It's a new identity. You're not that same guy. We've killed you. Whoever you were before is dead now. This is why I, like I, I try and push on so many young guys. I tell them, okay, get onto the Adonis Protocol. Kill yourself. Kill this version of you that you fucking hate, that gives you so much depression and anxiety. You hate being the loser who's getting like the back of his head slapped by the bully in class. You hate being the loser who the girl is friend zoning you and, and you're still texting her for three months or another girl you text and it's going so well, then she just stops replying. You hate that. So kill this version of yourself. Look completely and utterly different. Dress in a different way. Talk in a different way. Sit in a different way. Do the most important habits like exercise, building a business, working hard, being productive, reading, meditating, and gratitude journaling, and create a new version of yourself. Just today, we, we have just under 100,000 guys on, on this protocol now. 100,000. Which is huge. That's the program on school, or is that a different yeah, it's, This is my free school. Program. We have 100,000. Oh, that's free. Yeah, this I, is the free I also one. saw that, that school community, which is also crazy. You have 1,500 guys in there, I think. Yeah. And they're paying $129 a month. Yeah. My brother, you have like a 50 million euro value business then basically that's crazy man thank you props to you you. (laughs) that's an amazing accomplishment thank you how did you get like what do you teach in there tell us about it a bit more like this was the free program i think yeah so what's the pay program so free programs called adonis gang inside of that is the protocol like this big massive course that you get for free and there's almost a hundred thousand guys in there then the paid one is called adonis school 129 a month inside of there you basically get everything else that I do other than my YouTube. So I'm in there every single day. This isn't like one of those programs where the influencer makes it and then you have to like talk to random people. I do three calls a week in there minimum. Today we have that uh, business mastermind for those guys. I could, like what could I charge for a mastermind? Like 2K, 3K? Yeah. They get it as part of their 129 subscription. So it's like they get such a steal and there's one every single month with me and then we meet tomorrow as well. So there's three live calls with me where I'm teaching YouTube, I'm teaching business, masculinity, productivity, mindset, the most important things for men. Then we have a testosterone coach in there. That's uh, It's my brother. He was a pharmacist, manager. He was a pharmacy manager. So he's teaching testosterone, masculinity. He's ma- happily married for four years. So he teaches relationships. We have like general support coaches. So if there's a young guy who's trying to find his direction in life, he's not sure what business he should do. He's not sure what, how he should solve this problem. You can come on. We've got all these coaches. We've just gotten a new YouTube coach, Jack Piggott. He's got 400,000 subscribers. So he comes in and do does a, a call once a week with the young YouTubers asking him like, you know, do I, should I use this thumbnail or this one, whatever. So it's like you have a tribe of mentors. Then I make a premium course in there at least once a month as well. So there's like 18 courses. Each course I sold for $500, $1,000 before this. You get everything. Basically, Adonis School is just everything of mine. The entire and then university. That's it. it. It's just Hamza's brain, basically. And then someone asked me, it's like, oh, but you know, like, isn't the information free online? I was like, fuck no. Bro, go, go on YouTube right now, search like make $500 a day and go, go, learn from, go learn from these videos there. It's like, you can go, yeah, sure. You can go watch my YouTube videos. You can go watch some other YouTube videos. How much money have you made from YouTube already? Like not that much. There's a difference between YouTube videos where the creator makes it to get views and retention compared to a course in my school where I've made it just to try and get these guys results. Also, it's a time versus money investment always. Exactly. Like you can invest a lot of time into watching free content and research, researching it yourself, or you can just pay the money, the 129, and you get all the concentrated information in the same place and you learn it, bam, two hours. Yeah. Probably like that. That's always the, the course um, like dilemma, right? Invest money or invest time. You're always paying. It's just a lot of young guys don't know the dynamic. You're yeah. always paying. You are always paying. It's just, are you going to pay with time and go spend months watching like free bullshit content where it's not really about the thing that you wanted to watch, but you watch it anyway and you still haven't made your business. You keep flicking from business model to business model. Or do you want to just go like learn directly from the guy who's doing the business that you want to get into? So if you, if you want to get into YouTube, you want to get into like school and having an online community, which is what every influencer these days are doing. I think Adonis School is... Honestly, I, I really think it's a steal. Every day I think, like, how are these motherfuckers getting this for 129? I, I could be charging at least 500 a month. Bro, you got, like, thing. 200 grand MRR. <laughs> it's not enough, bro. <laughs> crazy, bro. It's not enough, bro. <laughs> That's something crazy. I'm trying to get to 100K this year with uh, nice. my AI business, but 200 grand is... 
yeah, it's insane, man. Yeah, it's, we we just um, won this. There's a big competition on the website we were on, and we just got first place in that as well. We had like the most money received in February. It's crazy. Yeah. Why don't you buy, go out and buy like a Ferrari or something? Um, you're pretty moderate still. Like you're making a lot of money. Yeah, and you're very like. Calm, relax, moderate, not going too crazy. Yeah, it's just not who I am. I, I will buy a car soon. I will go and like move out. I'll get like a nice like um, bachelor pad penthouse or something. I will start to upgrade my life a little bit more. I'm just, look, in 2020 when I moved back home, it was COVID. That was the happiest period of my life. I had nothing. All I had was a pair of gymnastic rings, $30, that's it. Every day I had a massive smile on my face with the old clothes I'd run outside to the park, set up the rings there, play music on my speaker, hit workouts outside, come home, eat some protein, work on my business and everything. I'm a simple guy. All I need is like a mattress on the floor. That's it. And so all the extra money, it's like, it's, I don't see it as for me. It's for my family. So it's, it's buying them things. It's, it's making sure that, you know, my brother and his wife take an amazing trip that they've wanted to go on. It's retiring everyone. It's stacking up a massive reserve so that if some crisis hits, like we're all okay. I'll certainly spend money on, on certain things. Like I, I like to yeah, spend money on But you've got plenty. Like you, you can easily spend and go out and buy a supercar or something. Yeah, of course. I, I spend money on food, bro. That's my biggest thing. It's like, I just like to eat. So I'll go to a restaurant. I'll get whatever I want. My friends always take the like a joke out of me because we'll go to a restaurant. They'll get one meal and I'll get like four and have half of each one just because I want to taste this. It. Like, it doesn't matter. If the bill's like 100 pounds or 300, it doesn't make a difference in my bank account. I haven't looked at the, the price of anything in like two years now. Which is odd. I was born in poverty. I was genuinely bo I, we You're should born. We should have told in Pakistan this. as well, right? Yeah, we should have told this story at the start because this is inspiring. Like I was born in genuine poverty. I didn't get enough calories to develop properly, and so my bones were all fucked up. I was very skinny. I was malnourished. I had like medical conditions. I had like rickets. My knees still today. My knees like caves inwards. I didn't have enough nutrients when I was uh, when I was a baby because we were. How so long did poor. you stay in Pakistan? Um, maybe about two, three years. Two, three yeah, that's interesting, man. You still have those those consequences today, then. Yeah, yeah. My my like, I I'm strong and I can run, I can squat and everything. But my right knee is like all all fucked up. It's like caved inwards and stuff. And you, you'll notice it if we like go to the gym together. I'm wearing shorts. You'll probably notice it a little bit. And it's like I didn't have enough calories when I was a baby. Oh, when I was like two Crazy, years old, yeah. three years old. Now I make just under two hundred thousand a month. That's insane. That's a very nice note to uh, to end on that bombshell. It's time to end. Thanks. If you ever watched Top Gear? No. no. Oh, there was some Top Gear. I was hoping you knew it from, <laughs> from the UK. <laughs> but never mind. No, thank you very much, man. It was an amazing thank podcast. You You're going on to the next one. Yeah. Um, I hope you enjoy my country, Holland. Thank you so and, much. And uh, have a nice evening and uh, afternoon. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. Subscribe down below. Of course, you all follow Hamza already. Follow us as well. New Money, the podcast. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.